Hi guys, welcome back to this channel, Kelvin here. For this episode, as you can see, we have a very special guest. His name is Darren, if you haven't know about him yet. Right now, he has about 7,000 subscribers, reaching 10k very soon. On his channel, he talked a lot about Tesla, Apple, and a lot of disruptive stuff. So Darren, welcome to this interview. Thank you for having me, Kelvin. Yeah. What big bang? <laughs> One thing that I noticed is you are a very new investor. You started investing just last year, right? Yes. But somehow you made all the right decisions, like you bought the right stocks, you invested with the right strategy, you even took a loan to invest. So how do you make all the right decisions? I started investing in August 2020. So slightly past a year only, very new investor. And whether it's the right decisions or not, it depends on your time frame as well. 12 months ago, everyone thought that Kathy Wood was super guru, super genius. Many years ago, it was Robert Kiyosaki, he reached that poor dad. And many more years ago, it was the guy who predicted the big bets, Michael Burry. I think time horizon matters. Right now, I've barely invested past 12 months, so it looks okay right now. How do I fare in a market correction? How do I fare in a five-year time horizon? Same thing like how we can't judge ARK investors in a one-year horizon. Two to three years from now, the story may flip again. So. It sounds like it's okay right now, but as you know, as a longer-term investor yourself, you started much earlier than me. The ups and downs. And what's important is our long-term performance. Right. How do you do your research to make sure that it's the right step for you? Investing is about information. And in the world of investing, I notice as a newbie that people are either very financially focused or they don't understand the financials at all. And just like how you can't evaluate a company only with finances, you also can't evaluate a company without some understanding of basic finances. So when I think of researching a company, what gives me more confidence? Ironically, I graduated with a degree in accounting and finance, but the finance are not the first thing I look at in a company. They are a basic thing, like, will they be profitable? And how much is it growing? But what's more important than numbers is the story behind the numbers. And I find that the story behind the numbers comes when I understand the products and services of a company. Because if you look at the past five year financials, it doesn't tell you what's going to happen next year. You'll need to really know more about what the leadership's trying to do, what consumers think about the company to get a better sense. So that's how I spend my time as an investor. I do a lot of research. As you all know, I mostly invest in Tesla. I'm 85% Tesla in my portfolio, about 10-15% Apple. The good thing about these companies is that they're tangible. You can see their products every single day in Singapore's roads as you go out there. So that's probably one reason why I don't invest in B2B companies as much or I have very little crypto holdings because you, you don't really see in your day-to-day -day life. So right now you are 37, right? And you just started investing at 36. What made you wanted to start investing? Why didn't you invest early on? There's no good reason why I didn't invest earlier. I was procrastinating and right. I thought I didn't know a lot. So we always think, oh, we will have time, we'll have time, we'll have time until the time passes by. Because of COVID, we have a lot more free time. So many people do different things to change their life. Some exercise, some change their diets, some change their countries. For me, there was time to actually investigate a little bit more about investing and that's how I got into it. I was like, okay, I have no excuse to not invest now. I'm stuck at home. What right. else can I do? Basically, you are too free last year. Had, <laughs> had more free time. So I can't just be playing computer games 12 hours a day. So investing was it. For most new investors, right, they find that uh, reading the balance sheet, uh, the financials is a very intimidating stuff. Do they actually need to read the financials to understand about the company? I think you need to understand the financials. Now, whether you need to read it or not, like reading the financials is one way of understanding the financials. Right. The good thing about today's world is that we have so much information. There's Reddit, there's YouTube, there's Instagram, there's TikTok. So if you don't want to read the financials, one option is to find other people who can help you to understand, analyze, and translate the financials in ways that you understand. And if you're a bit more savvy with it, maybe you work in finance, go ahead and read it, go ahead and do a deep dive. There are many ways to understand a company's financials. It isn't just about reading a financial report. Actually, that's also the same thing that I did. Lah. I just rely on other people and they interpret stuff for me instead. So it levels the playing field in a way because it makes it much easier for me to invest. There are people who don't think that Tesla is a good stock. What will you say to them? Not everyone needs to own Tesla. For the majority of us, when we invest, we invest to get returns. You have a target return, whether it's 10% a year, 20%, 30% year on year. Tesla is just one means to an end. There are many stocks out there in any given year that gives you 50, 60, 80% return. You invest in crypto, that goes even higher. It's not about convincing everyone to invest in Tesla. It's instead, find your own Tesla. Understand your risk appetite, understand your financial goals, and find your own high conviction investments. For me, it happens to be Tesla. 
In short, have fun staying poor. <laughs> Earlier this year, Ark Invest predicted that Tesla will reach 3K by 2025. Do you actually agree with their price target? Short answer is yes. There are a number of building blocks. I talk about them on my YouTube channel. But the net of it is, Tesla is a growth company. So 3K share price by 2025 isn't crazy when you look at Apple, Microsoft, or many other companies that have risen along the way in the past 20, 30 years. Even if you look at Walmart share price over 30 years, 3K share price, it's pretty okay. It's pretty moderate for a growth stock. If you invest in crypto, your returns are probably 10x more than investing in Tesla <laughs> over a long term. One of the reasons many people invest in Tesla is because of Elon Musk. And quite recently, he announced that he's considering becoming an influencer full-time, right? What do you think Tesla will become if Elon Musk touch wood, leaves Tesla? So first part, I want to talk about how a lot of people don't always get Elon's jokes. So sometimes they take Elon very literally when he's just making dry humor. Then he's having fun. So it's very important to understand Elon. So not everybody likes Elon because of that. Now with Elon leaving or not, so many companies, people call it key man risk because he's a very big part of the company. He's their chief engineer. He knows everything about engineering the products, which is so unique for a CEO. However, Tesla has now reached a stage where Imagine, if Elon's gone tomorrow, are people going to stop buying Tesla? Are there going to be less EV charges out there if Elon's no longer there? The answer is no. Why? Because they've already proven a viable business model. As recent as three years ago, right, when they had their Model 3 production hell, when Elon Musk was sleeping in the Tesla factory to solve problems, he was critical. If Elon wasn't there, Tesla would have been bankrupt within a month. Right now, their profits are growing and growing and growing. They're going to be the third most profitable car company in the world next year at least 6.4 billion in profits. They've got four global factories. They already have mass market vehicles already in production, the Model 3, the Model Y. Everyone who knows cars knows their brands. Whether you like them or not, it's a different story, but everyone knows Tesla, and the people who love Tesla are a very loyal group. So because of that, it is almost like Steve Jobs leaving Apple in August 2021. Right. Compared to Steve Jobs leaving Apple in the year 2000, when he just came back, when they haven't even launched the iPod yet. Tesla is a good, steady business that even if you just get good operational managers, they will be fine for the next 10 years. Apple's share price went up by 15 times in the 10 years since Steve Jobs left. And very few people will say that Tim Cook is the most visionary leader. The other company which Elon Musk owns is SpaceX and Starlink. So are you interested to invest in those companies? Yes. Okay, then my next question is because we can't evaluate this kind of companies based on its financials because they are private information. Yeah. So how will you evaluate this kind of companies? I'll say anyone who's investing in SpaceX or Starlink, you are very long-term investors. That means you're looking at a 10 to 20 year time horizon. I would recommend people who are values driven that you believe in the mission of SpaceX to invest in it because you're not going to see your returns in a long time. And they're going to be far better investments if you want higher rate of return or more liquid assets. There's also very big risk in investing in SpaceX or Starlink. One is the nature of the industry. They're launching rockets. Anything can happen. It takes a long time, a lot of failures. But the second is also the political nature of space. What I mean by that is governments, especially the Chinese government, would have vested interests against SpaceX potentially right. because SpaceX would allow the US government to put their astronauts on the moon and Mars first. China would rather be there first. So if you're investing in SpaceX or Starlink, you got to be very thoughtful that there are political risks, not just economic or business risks in investing in it. They are far easier investments to make. The reason why I choose to invest in SpaceX and Starlink, which is a subsidiary of SpaceX, is because I really believe in the mission. I'm very passionate about space. And it's super inspiring if one day, maybe not now, maybe the next generation, there are actually humans on other planets and other moons. Why SpaceX specifically? Why not like Virgin Galactic, right? Because Elon and SpaceX are the only company that is really serious about creating long-term human colonies in space. Right. Virgin Galactic, their main focus right now is space tourism. They're here to make money. Right. SpaceX's primary goal is not to make money. Their mission is literally to make humanity a multi-planetary species. Right. So for Elon, he doesn't care that it's not profitable, which will not make this a good traditional investment for most people. If Elon Musk passed away, would you then consider SpaceX and Starlink a good investment then? then it's very, very tough because SpaceX specifically needs Elon a lot, at least for the next 20, 30 years. I find it very hard for it to continue its bigger mission, especially of making us multi-planetary without Elon. The basic stuff of launching rockets for satellites as an earning revenue business, no problem. 
but the aspirational stuff without Elon is going to be very, very hard. This is not related to Elon Musk anymore. When you started investing last year, you chose those companies like Tesla, Apple, because they are the top companies, right? But let's say the top companies, all of them don't exist. Which other company would you then consider? So as we talked about earlier, at any given year, there are probably more than 100 companies that probably give more than 50% year-on-year return. On average, the S&P 500 is going to give you 9% return. If I didn't want to do any research, I'll just buy an ETF, I'll earn 9% return per year. Right. Easy. That is like the most brainless thing we can do. Much better than keeping our money in a bank or in a bond. Now, if I wanted to do a little bit more research, I'll look at companies where the product stickiness is very high. And it doesn't need to be tech. Example, Hermes, luxury products. Right. Hermes stock have went up by 70% year to date. In times of crisis, the rich get richer, yeah? They can't travel, so what they do? <laughs> buy more handbags, buy more watches, buy more leather products. So those would be examples of companies I'd invest in. May not be the most innovative of changing the world, but if it's financial returns you're looking for, that's one example I'll look at. Right. Just a fun fact, there's this portfolio called the Betty portfolio. The holdings are all the rich white girls' favorite stuff, like, like Starbucks. And that portfolio actually performed well <laughs> during the bull market. And it will do well even in the bear market because right. when times are bad, the rich get richer, poor get poorer, unfortunately. See, the people who lose millions of dollars can afford to lose billions. Right. The people who lose $100 they cannot afford to lose that $100. Are you always on the lookout for the next stock that can 10x? For me, because I'm a long-term investor, it means that I'm holding these stocks that I own for at least five, eight years, maybe 10 years. Right. So it's just like how, if let's say you're very happy in your company, you still interview in other companies just to understand the market and always just keep your skills up to date. So I'll passively look out for other opportunities, but my thesis is I'm going to continue dollar cost averaging, continue buying Apple, Tesla right. for the next three to five years, unless fundamentals change. Wow. My life is very boring. It's a very simple one. No surprises there. That's the same as me. La. But my reason is because I'm lazy to find other investments. Uh. <laughs> That's all. Let's talk about your YouTube journey. What made you want to start YouTube? I joined an external coaching program earlier this year. One of the things they asked us to do is to identify our life purpose. It's one of those aspirational things. And I said, I want to help others with economic opportunity because you can be NTU first class honours and still not get a good job. Education alone isn't enough. Right. Education is a means to an end. And for many people, it's financial security and eventually prosperity. So when I said that, everyone in the coaching group, they will ask us, okay, how do you bring your dream to life? Hold yourself accountable. So create action basically. And I told them, I'll create a YouTube channel because you can reach a lot of people. I thought that was the end of it. We have a WhatsApp group. Then after a while, they'll text and say, so what's your YouTube channel link? Can you share with me? I'll say, oh shit, now I really need to send a link, right? I can't just send Kelvin's Learns Investing and then that's it. So that's how I started six months ago. So once you know the, the true story, it's actually quite lame, right? No, no mega plan out there. One thing that I find super impressive was that it took you only like six months to reach 7,000 subscribers. How do you achieve this kind of growth? Because it took me like one year plus to even reach 1,000, 2,000. So when I do something, I try to do my 100% of it. So I believe in doing a few things in life, but doing them very well. Well. Mm. And even if I completely suck at it, if I just put in the hours, the effort, and just continue learning, I would be at least okay or better than half of the people. Right. So like, that's not the best performance, it's not the worst performance, it's pretty decent, but I really put in a lot of hours. So anything we do in life, there is a sacrifice. Whether you're working in a company, being a parent, starting a YouTube channel, there will always be sacrifices we make. And I don't think that's seen a lot in all the success or easy money or easy gains that you hear on the internet. I think the reason that you grow so fast is because your channel had value. And I think people like your videos is because that your videos actually help them. La. Like you actually go to interview specific people about Tesla. You even go to Germany, right, for the to look at the factory. I think not many people can do this kind of thing. And I think you achieve it. And that's why your channel could grow so fast. So to do that, like you really need genuine interest. Right. If you're doing it for the sake of growing a YouTube channel, you will burn out within three to six months. Right. Now, another specific tactical point here is most of my YouTube channel audience are not from Singapore. Right. So when you're trying to grow a channel, you think about your target audience, you've got to try to target a sizable, total addressable market. So for Kelvin, your channel was primarily focused on Singapore. It takes a lot more effort to grow a Singapore audience because our population is less than 6 million people. I talk about Tesla. That's relevant to people in the US, in Australia, in Germany, anywhere around the world. So 65% of my audience are not from Singapore. Singapore has 6 million people, the US has 340 million people. The total addressable market in the US is just significantly larger. So I focus on a, a bigger addressable market. And also Tesla is very topical right now. 
Just like how Apple was when Steve Jobs was alive. Right. You'll be focusing on Tesla's content next year? Yes. It'll still be about 70-80% Tesla. One, because most of my investments are with Tesla. Right. Second, I really love what the company is doing and the changes are very material, not just around the world, but here in Singapore as well. Then as SpaceX Starlink begins to edge closer to public listing or to more private funding rounds, I will talk more about it. Next year is going to be a very exciting year for SpaceX because their Starship is going to attempt their first orbital flight. The first few rockets are going to crash in the ocean. Elon says the chances of success, success are very low, but that's part of the thrill. Like, right. If success is guaranteed, it's no longer exciting. That means you're not exactly. pushing boundaries. It's like how nowadays, a lot less people would watch the Falcon 9 rockets landing because most people be like, yeah, you'll sure land, uh, no drama, no excitement. But Starship going to space and back, wow. Yeah, that would be super interesting. So I'm planning to go to the US in early 2022. Elon has said that they're going to host a Giga Texas factory tour and also opening party. <laughs> that would be super fun. Uh. Yeah. Uh, we will look forward to your content. As you guys know, I don't spend a lot of money on my equipment. I think the total that I spent was only like 100 plus minus. I saw from one of your earlier videos that you actually have a lot of equipment, cameras, mics, even a gimbal. You even upgraded your MacBook recently, right? Have you ever estimated how much did you spend on your YouTube stuff? It's a lot and <laughs> it's, it's not worth it. The main reason why I have all this is because I've been a techie for many years. I right. love all these gadgets to begin with. As Kelvin has demonstrated multiple times, you don't need a lot of this hardware for most YouTube content. There's a little bit of nuance here. In finance topics, we're mostly talking heads. You don't need very fancy cameras and most of the lighting audio is quite controlled. You're normally in indoor controlled environments. Right. But if let's say one day Kelvin's doing a travel vlog, you may need better audio and video equipment because you're in high dynamic range settings, foggy settings, rainy settings. You're traveling in noisy environments where you need a good mic to capture and isolate your sound. So depending on the nature of your content, the quality of equipment will matter more. But for finance channels, <laughs> no, not really. People just want good advice. The content and also the personality matters far more than whether you can see Kelvin's paws in 4K. <laughs> when I was doing YouTube on the site, I was having trouble finding time to do YouTube. But now you are making three videos a week, going out interviewing people. How did you actually find the time to do that? It is not easy. One of the small benefits is I work in a US tech company. So US tech firms have a more open work culture. You get the job done. So. I work seven days a week, but because I choose to. But if I want to go to the zoo with my daughter on a Monday afternoon, I'm there. The company I work in, they don't care so much about where you are at what time, but it's the job done. Are you achieving your KPIs or your OKRs, objectives and key results, as they call it in the industry? The other thing is just putting in the hours. There's no shortcut to it. I right. put in about eight hours a week because every video takes about three hours, three to four hours on average. One hour to, to script and film it, another three hours to edit and publish it. So I don't spend more than nine hours per week. Oh, really? So I normally do that on weekday nights or weekends, which is hard and comes with sacrifices because it, it means that I'm not always present in my family all the time. Sometimes on weekday nights, I'll be editing a video where my daughter wants me to read a book. I'll pause editing for a while. I'll read a book for 10, 15 minutes. Okay, you ready to sleep? <laughs> okay, good night. Back to editing. One advice that I have is actually the same thing that you talked about just now, is that you need to find a job that doesn't need you to OT yeah. so that you have more time to do your part-time stuff. There's another call out here that as many of you know, your work hours do not correlate to income growth. So work hard and smart together, both need to come hand in hand. And one of the reasons why I started investing is also because many of us are trying to transition from working for money to money working for us. You need to own capital for money to work for you. To truly grow your wealth, you've got to own capital. Whether it's stocks, properties, bond, crypto. If you're working for someone else, it is a salary. Your income growth is linear. It will never be exponential unless you happen to have shares in a company. Right. But then you're equity owner already. Let's talk about the future for a bit. We are now in 2022. What will your investment plan be any different from last year? The biggest difference is <coughs> I, I bought a little bit of genomic stocks last year, yes. And right. they're down 40, 50%. Because it's such a small part of my portfolio, less than 3%, I'll just hold it. I don't gain much Tesla stock by selling my, my losses, cutting my losses there. I think of it as education, like I pay money to learn more about genomics because it's very important to humanity and also my, my family. The main thing I'll do next year, as you've heard before, is the dollar cost average, I'll buy more Tesla, I'll buy more Apple. If the local bank start offering crypto, I will buy crypto as well as maybe 5-10% of all my investments. Wow, okay. I look forward to you talking about crypto next year. Finally, uh, what advice do you have for new investors? Investing like anything in life, we normally go into a new field thinking about what should I do? But one thing I'll share is don't just look at what you should do, but what you shouldn't do. Example, investing. People say, oh, you should have a stop loss. So you cut your losses and minimize your losses. But 
if you do that as a newbie, the institutional investors, the hedge fund will use that against you because they'll bring down the prices so that you sell your holdings and they'll buy your holdings and eventually it goes. So I don't have any stop losses for any of my investments. Now that's me. And that's one thing I choose not to do. The other thing is, as you all know, that new investors will think, when do I sell? When do I, when do I trade? When do I take profits? But as you get more seasoned, you also know that sometimes it is very important to not sell, to not do anything. The biggest gains can come from not taking actions. Right. So in the world of investing, also know when to not sell or not trade. And that comes with just questioning yourself, your motivations very deeply. If I sell and take profits now of whatever stock I'm buying, where is that money going to go to? If you still believe that that stock that you bought is the highest return or the highest conviction, your money is still going to go back there anyway. Mm. So you really have no value, no point in selling it unless you see another better opportunity. So be very thoughtful about how you think about things to do and not do. I think we have come to the end of this interview. Thank you, Darren, for joining me. If you guys haven't subscribed to him yet, do subscribe to him. His content is actually quite different from all the other YouTubers out there. But once again, thank you for joining me. And may you guys quite big big. <laughs> quite big big enough so that we can afford really good Thai fun next year. Right. Good. See you.